Lord, we ask that you grant us mileage in the spirit as we adventure through your word. Cause us to navigate into that place where you are. That we might be exposed to your government and to your reign. Be glorified in Jesus' mighty name. We pray. Amen. Please salute someone as you take your seat. Salute someone as you take your seat. Luke chapter 24, verse number 49. Luke 24, verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Not the manifestation of your supervising spirit that happens to be the Holy Ghost. You will tarry. You will bend the knee in prayer. You will call upon his name. And when you do, a spirit being will have an encounter with you. I know many of you may not have had such an experience before. And you are wondering how it will feel like. Don't worry. You don't need to have an experience. If he encounters you, you will know. And the Bible says it's a promise of the Father. If you can tarry, there is a promise that we are working on. And this promise is going to come to pass. And the manifestation of this promise is that the supervising spirit of your altar is going to show up. Are you there? Now, this is the goal as you service your altar. There is a goal that you are pursuing. And I need to streamline your activity so that you can have some determination and so that you can know that you have reached a high point in your interfacing with God. Come with me to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 1, I'd like to show you something quickly that is going to give you an expectation. You need an expectation as you navigate and as you transact with God. Now, so, can we begin our reading from the book of Luke chapter 1 verse 67? Luke Chapter 1, verse 67. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, This is the father of John the Baptist. And those of you that study the Bible in detail, you will know that be, between the Old Testament, between Malachi and Matthew, Pastor Dan, the theologian, what is the time difference between Malachi and Matthew, traditionally? Yes, so it's an average of 400 years, all right, between Malachi and Matthew. That's what we call a season of prophetic silence. 400 years where there was relatively no guidance from God. 400 years where there was no prophet prophesying and giving illumination as to what the counsel of God was. So it was a time that could be theologically called a time of prophetic silence. In order for God to break the silence, it took a strange event. And the event that we are talking about, you are aware of the naming ceremony of John the Baptist. That was the occasion that God decided to break the silence. And this was how the silence was broken. This was how prophecy was restored one more time 
after 400 years of prophetic silence. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he had visited and redeemed his people and had raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. So stay with me now. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers, to remember his holy covenant. The reason for the restoration, the reason for the return of prophecy is because there are certain things that God intends to perform. One of those things are the things that he has promised to our fathers. When you begin to operate as an intercessor, Establishing an altar to interface with the invisible realm. One of the things you are hunting for is to capture, is to compel God to give you a promise. I'm going to explain why. Number one is what? Promise. Let him give you a promise. Number two thing that you are hunting for, the Bible says, and to remember his holy covenant. You see, he will perform the mercy promised our fathers. If God has given you a promise, he will perform it. So if you have a promise from God, just like I do, and I will we'll have a practical session of eight minutes at the end of my teaching, let me manifest one promise that I have from God. I was doing my own business. I was doing my own thing. I was okay. Somewhere in northern Nigeria, in the core northern aspect of Nigeria. And we were in a meeting like this. And the praise and worship session was as powerful as the one we had tonight. And when I came to church and I began to flow with the rhythm of the Spirit, my eyes were open and I saw beyond the roof of the building. I saw myself in heaven. I will not tell you what I saw in heaven. But if you are so interested, let me give you one idea. In heaven, I was not a small man. In heaven, I was a big man. Yes. So let me stop that one. But I saw myself in heaven. And that vision was held before my face for like 15 minutes. I saw Jesus in heaven. And when Jesus was coming, everybody laid down on the ground. So when, in fact, he's coming, what announced his coming was a great light. Where we were was full of light. But what announced the coming of Jesus was a great light. And as we saw that light coming, everybody laid on the ground, and covered his eyes. So you could hear his, the sound of his feet as it came closer and closer, and it stopped over my head, and I saw that he was wearing brown sandals. Then he asked me to stand up. So I stood up, and there were eight people Eight, seven other people, me inclusive, eight, that were standing before that vision left. And I could recognize all those people. Some of them have lived in other generations, but I recognize all of them. Then I came back to the place where we were having praise and worship. And then the angel whispered to me a message from Jesus. Take my presence and power 
to the peoples of the world. That was a covenant that God gave me. That I have the authority to take his presence and what? His power to the peoples of the world. So if I want to go for a meeting now, I just take a fast and I begin to pray. I say, I was sitting on my own. And you came and told me that I should take your presence and your power to the peoples of the world. So that covenant he made with me is a basis of consistent demand. Do you understand that? So as you practice your life around the altar, you are a hunter. The first thing you are hunting for is for a promise from God. Do you get that? Yes, sir. <laughs> Hallelujah. These are, these, are, these are deep matters. The second thing you are hunting from God is you are hunting for a personal covenant. So what he gave me was a personal covenant. I can also tell you times when he gave me a promise. As long as you have a promise, God will perform it. As long as you have a covenant, God will remember it. Is that clear? Don't be distracted. You have reached a day of great joy when you trap a promise from God. Number two, what's the second thing you are hoping to trap? A covenant. Someone might ask me, what is the difference between a promise and a covenant? Who is asking that one? I'm the one that asked this, not you. I'm the one. All right, go to the next verse. Meanwhile, I'm going to show you the difference. The oath which is swear unto our father Abraham. The third thing that you are hunting for is an oath. Because sometimes God swears. Hallelujah. Can you give the, give the evangelist a mic? Let us interview him. You know, when we are talking about issues of priesthood, any man that practices these matters has an experience that we can draw from. Evangelist, what made you feel that God was sending you to Brazil? Give us the account. You don't need to stand up. Okay. Uh, actually, I am this kind of person that... Ah, you are going far. You are going far. Go straight. What did you hear from God that convinced you okay, said, that you are a missionary? He to said to me, the, I will send you. I will send you. Like I sent Joseph. Like I sent Joseph. To help his brethren. To help his brethren. In a territory of a strange language. In a territory of a strange language. And wait. He, Wait, wait. We want to benefit from your story. Are you there? God meets a man. Were you a youth copper then or you were working then? I was working then. He was he's a civil engineer for your information. And he was working on site. His hope as a civil engineer was that he should hit a major contract that will keep him busy for a very long time and money will be flowing. But while he was on site, God spoke to him and said, I will send you. Like I sent Joseph to a people of a strange language. What's the name of that language? Portuguese. Portuguese. Before you went to Brazil, did you even know that there was a language called uh, Portuguese? Okay, never... he didn't know that there was a language called Portuguese. <laughs> and God was sending someone that does not know anything about the language that is spoken among those people and the evidence that god sent him to those people is that god miraculously made him begin to speak portuguese is that true in 24 hours in 24 hours what was the listen listen you are not you are not following listen what happened before you started speaking Portuguese. I was to go for a meeting. He was to go for a meeting in the northern part of Brazil. In the normally, northern part. I, yes. I, I I go with an interpreter. He goes with an interpreter because I don't know anything in Portuguese. Okay. So by midnight, the interpreter called me and said he was not going. There was now, so his interpreter disappointed him by midnight. 
the pastor called me and said, just appear so that it will not look as if we, we can't, uh, it was his car. So the pastor wanted to preserve his integrity. So he said, you just come. And shout hallelujah. So when you come, you shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, because that's the best you can do under the circumstances. The pastor cannot understand English, he cannot interpret. So you just come and provide evidence that I did not, it's not a scam. So when I went, the Holy Spirit said, you will preach in Portuguese. Now, wait. Do you realize that this supernatural manifestation is occasioned on a covenant? You want to do business with a spirit being? Hunt for a commitment from that being in form of a promise, in form of a covenant, in form of an oath. I will show you some matters. As I preach in English, translating, interpreting Portuguese. Okay. Jesus' power is superpower. Poder de Jesus é poder super. The power of God will conquer the power of the devil. O poder de Deus vai vencer poder do diabo. This is an evil man. Wait, you are not. <laughs> What you are seeing is supernatural. When I went to Brazil, he was interpreting for me. <laughs> yes. So he had preached in, but I hope you know, some of you understand your language so well, but you cannot interpret in your language. So he had spoken Portuguese to a level that he was not interpreting. He was my interpreter when we went to Brazil. What is happening here is the commitment of a spirit being. So when you hunt, hunt for a commitment from the Holy Ghost in form of a promise, in form of a covenant, in form of an oath. So I'm telling you that I have a covenant. And this covenant guarantees that I can invoke the presence of God. I can call it. And the presence of God will come. I'm not saying tomorrow. Today, I will invoke the presence of God. If the presence of God comes down, one of the things that will suffer most from the manifestation of the presence of God is if somebody has any instrument from the kingdom of darkness. That instrument will suffer in the face of <laughs> the Holy Ghost. And what I'm telling you, I know it nationally and internationally. I've seen wizards from the underworld that came to challenge me. I've seen witches, they gathered and they were cursing me in their language. Curse. I allowed them to curse for, for some time so that they will, it, it will be on record that they, they did something. Then I cast out all the spirits from all the people. Cause, because I have power to do that from Jesus by covenant. Are you there? So what a spiritual man can do is based on the covenants that he has secured from the Holy Ghost. If we bring you on the scene now, what your prayer can do, what your preaching can do, what your administration can do is based on the covenants that you have secured. So we hunt for promises, we hunt for covenants, and I need to show you the difference between a promise and a covenant. Are you still with me? I'm talking about the manifestation of the supervising spirit of your order. The way to profit from the presence of that spirit is to press into him enough for him to give you what? A promise, a covenant, or to make an oath with him. Because God, God can swear sometimes. Is that clear? All right, come with me to the book of Hebrews. I'll just show you these matters. And then we'll move to the next matter, next item. Hebrews chapter 6. Verse number 13. 
Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 13. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could not swear by no greater, he swore by himself. Now, there is a way covenants are caught in the times of the Old Testament. Are you with me? Because of the unreliable nature of man, somebody can give you a promise and escape. A certain governor in a state promised someone that he was going to rule and give him the mantle of leadership. He only requested five billion naira. And the person, I don't know how he managed, whether it was a bank loan or something, was able to get five million naira and submitted to the government. When they were doing primaries, the governor said, ah, you are not here. Please come, please come. There's, come and receive your glory. You've labored. So the man dressed well, and he, he marched into the, the party hall like this. And they announced somebody else. Now, they didn't even allow him to stay away from the shame. They said, come, come, ah, what are you? So he now moved in the flesh, and this I came. <laughs> and they gave someone else the primaries. The person did not win the primaries. It was him that they announced. That's how man is. And because man is like that, man will hardly trust. Even if you are not like that, they want something else for you to do to make you trustworthy. So even though God had made a promise to Abraham, and you and me know that our God is faithful, our God does not turn back on his word, our God means what he says, and he says what he means. How many of you know that? I know that. I know that. I've risked my life because I heard God speak many times. And I'm still here. Because I was sure of the one that spoke. And as long as it was God that spoke, we will go for it with all our strength. Hallelujah. That's how God wants us to deal with him. But you see, at this time, Abraham did not yet know God. So he needed some proof that God would not abandon him. So God decided that, okay, I'm going to take an oath. And God swore by himself because there was no greater than him. Normally when oaths are taken, one needs to swear by someone that is greater than him, but it happens to be that God could find no greater than him, so he swore by himself. The implication of swearing by someone that is greater than you is so that if you default in your commitment, that person whose name you have invoked will slay you, will destroy you. But see, there was no one greater than him, so he swore by himself. Meaning that if he goes back on his words, he will have to destroy himself. That was when Abraham was able to believe that God was, will deliver upon the promise that God had made. Are you there? All right, next verse. Saying, blessing, I will bless thee. This is the content of the promise. And multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Next verse. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of his promise the mutability of his counsel, confirmed it with an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we may have a strong consolation. Now stay with me. The reason why God went ahead to swear to Abraham after that he gave Abraham a promise 
was not because God had a tendency of failing to keep his promise, but God wanted to help Abraham's faith. So the additional commitment of taking an oath was an additional commitment God was willing to take so that Abraham can fully take delivery of the things that God was offering him. He had nothing to do with God. It had everything to do with Abraham's faith. Are you there? So, if you understand this, my lecture, what I'm saying, therefore, is that God's promise is equal to God's covenant for people that know God. So there will be no need for God to swear after he has given you a promise because we know that he says what he means and he means what he says. The reason why he went beyond promise to take an oath is because of Abraham's faith that by two immutable things wherein it is impossible for God to lie, we may have a strong consolation. Do you understand that? So God's promise is equal to his covenant. So if you are dealing with God in the place of prayer, and you are pushing in prayer, and pushing in prayer, and pushing in prayer, the objective of your pushing is not pushing. The objective of your pushing is to secure God's commitment. And God's commitment can come in form of a promise. God's commitment can come in form of an oath. God's commitment can come in form of what? Of a covenant. So I'm saying that I have a covenant with God. And that covenant has to do with the mandate that God give, gave me to take his presence and his power to the peoples of the world. Because I have this covenant, I can invoke God's presence and I will do it here. I will invoke it today. Whether I pray or not, I can do that one. I'm not saying don't pray. But I'm saying that there are times that my prayers were not up to date. But I still invoked his presence. Because it's by covenant. It's not really by my prayers. Even though I'm up to date in prayer. Now, just in case you're asking, are you up to date? I'm up to date. <laughs> hallelujah. I say hallelujah. That by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. Okay, number three, the protocols of setting up a personal altar. The third point I need to bring to your notice is that the moment the supervising spirit of your altar comes, you must be very, very competent. Now, please help me tell those nursing mothers that it is a crime for your child to be crying in the hall. If you notice that your child is disturbing us, can you step out, please, in the name of Jesus? Is there any usher up there? Please, instruct the person with that child. We have many places. This open floor here, with the television and everything, is for nursing mothers. Please, take your child to that floor, and the child can cry, and nobody will hear, and you'll be following the service. Don't allow nursing mothers to sit up there. Direct them to the open floor. Are you with me? Okay. When the supervising spirit of your altar comes, you must be competent in a particular matter, which is, which I call appeasement. The Bible says that just like you do not know the way that bones are formed in the womb of her that is with child, even so know it thou not the way of the spirit. Yes, evangelist is a civil engineer. You learned that in school. Pastor Dan is an electrical, electronics engineer and a theologian. He learned that in school. Anything you learned in school, you know a little of it. The Bible is saying you don't know the way the bones are formed in the womb of a woman that is with child. In the same way, you do not know the way of 
the spirit. The way a spirit being accomplishes a task is different from the way a natural person accomplishes a task. The things human beings like is different from what a spirit being likes. You will never know this until you begin to sustain a close relationship with the spirit being. When you do, you will find out that you just do something you normally do that you think is common among men and then the spirit being that you are intimate with is going to be irritated. In your own eyes, you have done nothing wrong. But if you are interested in ensuring that your relationship and your fellowship with the spirit being that you are consulting continues, you will need to learn how to appease that being. I told you before that nine times on this altar, I preached a powerful sermon and the congregation were rejoicing that their pastor is a powerful pastor. But none of you designed that the Holy Ghost had left me. So after hearing your clapping, I left here and went home and laid on the ground and begged and begged and begged all night. He did not accept. I continued begging from early in the morning till 4 p.m. the next day before our quarrel was settled. Come with me quickly to the book of Exodus chapter 32 and I'll read the scripture to you. This is number three. You must be competent in the ways of appeasement because the way you are going to know the spirit being that you are fellowshipping with is by what the spirit being does not like. So when you know, and this, there is no way I can teach you this one theologically. Are you there? You will know this experientially. Apart from clear scriptures that say, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not... Huh? Apart from those clear scriptures, you are going to find other aspects of irritation that comes to the Holy Ghost on the account of certain aspects of your lifestyle. The meaning of that is that this, your lifestyle that irritates him, that is not necessarily seen as it were. You avoid it. If you want to keep anything with him, you have to avoid it. Do you understand that? Okay, let's do Exodus chapter 32, and I'll read from verse number 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down, from the mound, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us, for as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. Do you know the meaning of this? Do you know the meaning of this statement? Or oh, you are not following? The request to make a God was to create a replacement for Moses. Not necessarily a replacement for God, but a replacement for Moses. Say, make us other gods, because as for this man Moses, we do not know where he is. So these guys are, they are not saying make us a God that will replace Jehovah. What are they saying now? Make us a God that will replace Moses. Because Moses was like their medium. So now that Moses has gone, raise an altar, raise an idol, so that through that idol, we can communicate with what? With Jehovah. Do you get the idea? So it was, not, it was not really that they had backsliding. But their suggestion, as you will see in the reading, was an irritant to God. It was irritating in the sight of God. Yet, number, verse number two. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives of your sons and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. 
and all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool. And after he had made it a molten calf, and they said, This be the gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. If you notice the verse 1, you will see that it was Moses that they said brought them out of the land. So these gods now are a replacement for Moses. Next verse. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. So he, in order to, are you there? Yes, sir. They built the God, which is supposed to be a replacement of Moses, and built an altar before it so that they can use the altar to communicate and to commit the God. And made proclamation and said, tomorrow is the feast to the Lord. You see, they are still, they, are still, they believe that. If you understand, they have not cast out the Lord. <laughs> I took my time to study this, this, scripture, this scripture. All right? They, they have, they, these guys are not, they have not backslidden. They have not cast out the Lord. So now that we have a replacement for Moses, tomorrow let us come for a feast to the Lord. Okay? Verse 6. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. They supervised the real spirit whose imagery was in their creation came and possessed them. I hope you know what play means. So no need for me to go into details. Hallelujah. Play there is to commit immorality. It is what we call um, temple prostitution. You may not know, but prostitution began from spiritual worship. What we call prostitution today came from the temple of idols. Because when the spirits possess them, that is an act of worship. It's only the guy that is rolling on the streets that sees immorality as fun. He doesn't understand that what he has done there is that he has made obeisance to a spirit being. So the guys began to commit immorality because the spirit that they were connecting to, that they were signaling to, the supervising spirit came and it was not Jehovah that came. They now saw themselves behaving in a way that was contrary to the laws of Jehovah. Even though in their mind, this is just an arrangement to make it easier for us to reach Jehovah since Moses that speaks for him and speaks from him we don't know his whereabout. Nobody leaves home for 40 days and doesn't come back. And we still, the next thing you will see on Facebook is obituary. <laughs> you are not. <laughs> are you there? Yes, sir. It's the spirit that responded, not Jehovah. All right, next verse. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go get thee down for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted them. So even at this time, God, God did not associate with the people. He said, thy people. <laughs> the strange set of people that you went to bring from Egypt, <laughs> they have corrupted themselves. So can you see why Moses broke the Ten Commandments? Because the people broke it even before he brought it. So there was no need. No, these people that are fornicating, is it them that you bring? Thou shalt not steal. They will not hear. So they had already broken the commandments before Moses arrived from the top of the mountain. So there was no need to give them the commandment. He broke it. And they had turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, This be the gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. I don't have time to read all. I have a catalog of scriptures. 
This was how God saw their actions. Can you see that the way God saw their actions was different from the way they saw their actions? They saw their actions as helping the, the system, the spiritual system, to still be able to connect with God now that Moses is lost. He has, he has left home. His wife is mourning already. So let us keep our spiritual life alive. That was what they thought. And from the eyes of God, God is seeing another form of worship emerging. God is seeing idolatry emerging. And that's supposed to be the first commandment written on the tablet of stone that Moses is going to give them. The first, very first one has been violated. The people no longer qualify to receive the laws of God. Next verse. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen these people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that I, that my wrath might wax hot against them, that they may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. If Moses had accepted this offer, they, they would not have been called Israelites, they would have been called Moselites. Next one. And Moses besought the Lord. This is the skill that you have to develop. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why dost thou thy wrath wax hot against thy people which thou hast brought forth from the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? First of all, Moses rejected the people. He didn't accept that they were his people. Are you with me? <laughs> Moses said, this you, why is your anger <laughs> wax wrought against you? have made an investment here. Who, who, which businessman will invest like this and then become angry? Be patient. There's profit coming out of this matter. This Moses talking to God. And in the process, he was able to confirm that the people are his people because he invested power and invested what? A, a mighty hand. So you can't deny them at this point. Your mighty hand, not your small hand, the mighty one went forth to secure their deliverance. That investment that you have made has already made them your people. So why are you angry? This skill, you have to learn it. No pastor can teach you. It's when you begin, when you begin to interface, when you begin to interface, you will learn this language. Are you there? You, you have to learn that language. Like this evening, even if God doesn't want to do anything this evening, this language, I will use it, I will convince him. And there's no way I can teach you. It's a language of intimacy. Just like you don't, you don't learn how to communicate with your wife. You don't. You know, I was a virgin when I married, and I married a virgin woman. So, are you there? I remember when we came for... Wedding, my wife dressed in a very powerful way. And then I just came down from the vehicle. I greeted everybody and I was going. My mother in law said, Hey, which can't what, what, can't you see that? The way your wife is dressed. I said, Ah, mommy, you're not aware. We are holiness pastors. Kayalo <laughs> Korea. <laughs> I didn't know that my mother in law kept that in mind. When we now brought my first son, he said, Is this a work of holiness? <laughs> Whose work, whose work is this? <laughs> may the Lord give you understanding. May the Lord, may the Lord. May the Lord give you understanding. In the name of Jesus. The moment your spirit opens to him and he comes, you will learn that language. Next verse. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy first wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Eh? This is Moses. He's a human being speaking to God. Turn! Because Egypt will speak. 
Egypt will say you are incompetent to bring them into the land that you have promised them. That's why you came and cajoled them in between the road. And it will go down in history. I, when God heard it. Are you there? He said, wherefore? No, go, 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 go. Remember. Then he brings covenant. Abraham. Isaac. And Israel. Thy servants. To whom thou swearest by thy own self. And said unto them, I will multiply your seed at the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed. And they shall inherit it forever. I'd like you to go back and then see the points. He brings out a covenant. He brings out how God's anger is going to create an occasion for unbelievers to judge him as a powerless God. He brought so many matters before God. And on the strength of these arguments, even Jehovah Adonai, he repented of his anger. As you deal with the Holy Spirit intimately, he will not spare you an opportunity to show you that he is not pleased with a certain action that you need to beg. If you start begging, hmm? the Holy Ghost himself will give you words. This was, it's not as if Moses was so bright. He was giving these words to speak to the Father. The Holy Ghost will give you words. But you see, it is when he begins to rebuke you, when he begins to register his displeasure, it's an opportunity for you to know the things he will not accept. You know the Bible says you know not the way of the Spirit. Now how bones are formed in the womb of a woman that is with child. The way you begin to know God's way is when he begins to express his displeasure. Then you say, oh, okay, you don't like this. Oh, I won't do it again. You don't like that. I hope you know, all through your work with God, you will never outgrow this adjustment. You will never, out and I'm not talking of Sino. I'm talking of probably the things of men. Your husband treats you bad and you want to suffer him. Then he will, he will get angry. Say, this man, let's do something to him. Let's, let's touch him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Then you get displeased. And the moment he's displeased, you know you, you don't have the energy to pray again. The only thing you have energy for is to plead with him. Plead. You plead with him. So you must become very competent in the art of appeasement. If you are going to sustain your fellowship with God. Is that clear? This number what? Now, so I want to give you the lecture for today. And I'm going to digress. I want to show you number four. If you understand the art of appeasement, then I want to show you that you have come to a point where your altar will begin to speak. Now I need to show you the speakings of an altar. The speakings of an altar. And in showing you the speakings of an altar, I will show you, I will digress and show you how to use your altar to fight. What I titled altar versus altar. You should be able to read the speakings that is coming from the altar you are operating. Because every altar speaks. The moment you bring a sacrifice and you put on the altar, it begins to speak into the spirit realm. It's just like a transmission. Just like your GSM uh, terminal gives off G G frequencies. Transmissions. Are you there? The transmissions are not audible to the human ear, but your phone has what it takes to be able to catch and to maximize the transmissions. Okay, let me show you a few scriptures. 
Genesis chapter 22, beginning from verse 5 to 8. Genesis chapter 22, beginning from verse 5 to 8. And Abraham said unto his young men, I hope you know where I'm at, number four now, that altars speak. Altars speak. The moment you put a sacrifice on it, and we have different types of sacrifices. And the most powerful sacrifices are the sacrifices that God himself calls for. Are you there? If God says, stand before me for 20, 21 nights. From 12 midnight to 3 a.m. And it is God that gives you the instruction. It is a very powerful sacrifice. Are you there? If God says, you go empty your bank account and give what is contained therein, it's a powerful sacrifice. Now, number two, if God does not say, stand before me 12 midnight, and you decide to stand before God 12 midnight, you will get either 60-fold or 30-fold. If God says it, do this, and you do it, you will get 100-fold. Exactly. But make sure you are not getting nothing. <laughs> oh my. Uh, help me preach to your neighbor because some of you are getting zero. Make sure you are not pre you are you are guilty. You've been getting zero for the past how many years? Tell your neighbor, help me preach to your neighbor. That is close to you. Say make sure you are get you are not getting zero. If you initiate the process, you are going to get 60 or 30. If God is the one responsi responsible for the sacrifice, you will get 100 for. Is that clear? But uh, by all means, do not score what? Zero. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide here. With the ass, and I and the Lord will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the bond offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for the bond offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. There's something catching my attention here. We're going to do a lecture on that, which is place. They came to the place. They came to, there was a location that God showed them that their offering, their sacrifice will count. And we are going to talk about an altar as a consecrated place. So that, that will be later. That will be later. And uh, if we want to establish a national altar, we will need to f get a consecrated place. Um, I don't want to say some things online. I know a few things about covenants in various territories that has held the power of darkness in those regions. I can say it offline, but not online. Those places have been dedicated and consecrated. And it's a stronghold for demons. A demonic stronghold has been built by the transactions that are going on in that location. So we are going to talk about the consecrated place, which is one of the definitions of an altar. So you will notice that God said he has to go to, he saw the place that God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. 
it will interest you to know that that's the same spot where Jesus was crucified. The same spot. The same actual spot. The sacrifice that was rejected in Isaac was accepted in Jesus. So, i also show you something called foundation. Maybe through this you'll be able to understand the concept of foundation. The concept of foundation. Maybe through this scripture, when we go into those matters. To, and we'll be looking at it under the subject, demonic legalities. That's when we'll speak deeply on uh, inheritances. That's when we'll speak deeply on the concept of headship that is the basis of the power of a wizard. That's when we'll speak deeply on, on critical issues that create premise for the delivery of satanic power. And then I can teach the subject of warfare and how to use your altar to manipulate the price tag. Hallelujah. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the moment, the moment the young man, he had released the young man from his heart. The time interval between when he released the young man from his heart and when he did the actual killing, the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven. So this is the first call. Are you there? Yes, this is the first call. Notice this is the first call. The first call or the first speaking because an altar has two voices. The first speaking of an altar is, is the value of the sacrifice that have been offered according to the estimation of the shekel of the sanctuary. How many of you still remember the shekel of the sanctuary? From the perspective of the spirit realm, the value of what was sacrificed. If any of you come from a family where witchcraft has been practiced before, the witches want to kill the person that is the breadwinner, the person that is of utmost value to the family, the person that is of utmost significance in the family. As long as that person is alive, people will go to school, people will have food to eat, people will be able to make ends meet. He is in the center of the survival of that family. He has a value according to the shekels of the sanctuary. He's the one that witches will be interested in killing because if you kill that one, are you there? Maybe 45 people will enter into suffering. The value they draw from the person's absence is the suffering that comes upon the 45 people. That is the energy that promotes that witch in the realm of witchcraft is the value that is coming from the soul of these people in their anguish on the account of the loss that has been experienced. Who is still here? Okay. So this is the first signal. The moment the boy left the heart of Abraham, it registered in the spirit. And then the angel spoke and said unto him, out of heaven, Abraham, and he said, here am I. Next verse. And he said, lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the ticket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called upon the name, called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Next verse. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham out of heaven. This is what? 
the second time. You see, there are two times that the angel call. Now, this second call is the speaking of the altar, the consequence of the sacrifice that has gone into the realm of the spirit. This second call, this is what we call the speaking of the altar. Let us see what the altar is speaking. And he said, by myself, this is a spirit being, do you, can you see, have I what? What's, what's that? An oath. You know, I told you that when you are hunting in the spirit, you hunt for a promise. You hunt for a covenant. You hunt for, I don't know. By myself have I sworn, said the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son. Is this not the same thing he said the other time? It's the same thing. This is the speaking of the altar. Yes? Next verse. That in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thee, and thy seed as the stars of heaven, and so on. So, the speakings of this altar spoke blessing. And it's very easy for you to read the writings of blessing. Is it not so? Oh, you don't want to answer me. Well, because you cannot answer me, I will not speak about speakings of altars again. And this is a refresher. I just digressed to show you this matter before I can come back. I, I ask you, are you... Oh, yes. <laughs> okay, we have online people. We have online people. So that's the speaking of the altar. So an altar can speak blessings. And we should be able to read. It is very easy to read the inscription of blessings. One of the inscription of blessings is check the thing that the person is doing. If he lays his hands upon, to, upon something to do, does he prosper? That's one of the writings of blessing. Are you there? You you tried to sell try to sell fish. And uh, when you counted the money that you made, it was not up to the amount you used to buy the original fish. You are not following me. That is also, we should be able, just like it is easy to read the handwriting of blessings, it's also easy to read the handwriting of reproach. And when the description of your existence is failure, reproach, hardship, what you are dealing with is not a lack of business ideas. What you are dealing with is not a lack of business strategies. What you are dealing you don't it's not a course you need to enlighten you. What you are battling with, the handwriting of reproach is littered over your life, and the meaning of that is that there is a, an active altar that is speaking. Because every altar speaks. And the thing about altars that I need to establish here quickly, are you there? If an angel causes a problem in scripture, if an angel causes a problem, it's an angel that will solve the problem. If God is responsible for a problem, it is God that will solve the problem. If the sons of God cause the problem, another generation of sons of God will manifest to solve that problem. That's the law of the Bible. How many of you still remember the Ark of Noah? When, when Noah entered into the ark, do you know that God came from without the ark and locked the door of the ark so that Noah would not be moved with compassion to open for anybody? So it was God that locked the ark. It was beyond the authority of Noah to unlock. It was when God wanted that God now showed up and unlocked the ark. So the reason for which I say this is because if your problem is caused by an altar, the only solution will be by another altar. Now, that first altar is speaking. 
You there? We need to establish another altar that we speak. Not just speak, but speak better things. So your escape route from an altar is another altar. In fact, most people, okay, let me not, let me use the Bible to speak. Can we do Genesis? Uh, judges. So have you seen what I mean by the speaking of an altar? You are not, you are not here. Let me, let me make it plain for you to understand. Miscarriage, if there is a consistent, a consistent story of miscarriages, we are dealing with an altar. If there is a case of unnatural poverty, not, not that the person is not hardworking, the person is hardworking, the person has initiative, the person is willing to work, but there is something beyond his efforts that is resisting him, we are dealing with an altar. That's a speaking. Are you there? If you put money into the person's hands, and in the next two months, the person cannot give account of what he did with that money, we are dealing with a speaking. So it doesn't matter how many opportunities this person gets to have, the opportunities will not translate to anything worthwhile because there is a spiritual thing that is speaking and it is swallowing the impact of his natural efforts. See, if you have an altar of blessing aligned with your life, are you there? If you have an altar of blessing aligned with your life, the altar of blessing will not exempt you from hard work. But in that your hard work, there will be results beyond your effort that will, that, will, that will arise from your hard work. If an altar of reproach is, is angulated against your life, it will not exempt you from hard work. But your hard work and your efforts will be swallowed up and you will not see the impact of your input. In any of the cases, there's still hard work. If you see someone that is lazy and the person is poor, that is supposed to be poor. He's supposed to be poor because the Bible says, I went by the field of a slothful man. I went by the field of a man that lacked understanding and the stone wall was broken, broken down. It was over covered with weeds. Then said I, Yet a little sleep, yet a little slumber, yet a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveled, and thy want as an armed man. <laughs> There's no book like the Bible. <laughs> he said, thy want will come like an armed man. As if an armed man is attacking you, that's the reason why. But his poverty is because of slothfulness. I'm not talking of slothful people, I'm talking of hardworking people. But their hard work does not translate to anything worthwhile because there is something swallowing the outcome of their efforts. And their efforts amount to nothing. Are you there? We are talking about speakings. Oh my, you are not with me. Oh, when they are speakings, and an altar of death is speaking, one of the things you are going to notice is that there is going to be an age bracket that people cannot survive beyond. If you notice that science in your bloodline, are you there? Yes, there is an altar. And there is a way to fight an altar. If an altar is involved, then an altar must be erected. It is not another job you need. What you need is bring down the altar. 
and there are many people under the sound of my voice for the past eight years, for the past 12 years, some of you have not been promoted. You don't even know what promotion is. I'm talking about your office. No promotion. You might just be dealing with an altar. All your children are just going gaga. No one is reasonable. No one is forthcoming. You need to deal with it early. You will wake up to a colony of monsters. An altar is at work. Are you there? All right. So let me show you one matter. Show you one matter. Then we'll pray. I need 15 minutes to manifest my covenant with God. I was sitting on my own, doing very well. And God came and said to me, take my presence and my power to the peoples of the world. It was not what I chose. That's what God chose. And he chose that he will use me to accomplish that. I have a covenant with him on that matter. And because I have a covenant with, and trust me, I, I didn't plan before I came. I didn't pray about this at home. You know, when we do crusades, I pray at home and just come and manifest the prayer. This one, I didn't pray so that I will pray here. If my altar is alive, you will see it today. I might say, sickness go, and sickness will go. Don't think it's, it's what I said that is responsible. Oh, you are, you are wrong. What is responsible is the altar. The altar behind what I am saying. Are you there finally? Can we do Judges chapter 6? Are you there in Judges chapter 6? Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. Okay, I'll read from verse 21. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unliving cakes. And there rose up a fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unliving cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it what? Jehovah Shalom. The Lord our peace. I will come to. I will come to that. And unto this day is yet in Ophra of the Beersrites. Beersrites. And it came to pass. The same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that is in thy father, that, that thy father hath, and cut down the groove that is by it, and build an altar of the Lord God upon the top of this rock in the other place and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the groove which thou shalt cut down. Are you? God insisted that 
you will use the raw materials that you get from the altar you break down use it as fuel to offer the sacrifice that you are going to raise offer a sacrifice on the altar that you are going to raise as a replacement for the old altar the way to undo the power of an altar is the principle of replacement please help me tell your neighbor replacement the problem with all the people that have come to us can you come to our village and destroy the altar yes we can come and indeed we have gone to some villages unfortunately for the people that we went to undo the altars in their families they did not raise another altar to replace the old one when you destroy one altar and it's not so easy it's not so difficult to destroy an altar we will try some things here today but the question is are you ready to replace it are you ready sister we destroy the ones in our families and we raise we raise the ones and we are going to attend to it all the days of our lives they are not ready for replacement they are, they're just like the ceremony. Okay, we are chasing Satan out. The man that set up that altar, he served that spirit all his life. And in the realm of the spirit, there is nothing you can achieve that will negate the principle of equilibrium. Someone in your family must set up another altar. Another altar that will be the replacement of the old altar. <laughs> mm. that is how the speakings of the new altar will become your reality just like the speakings of the old one was your previous reality there must be an equilibrium if it cost someone his entire life standing before a demonic altar it will cost somebody his entire life standing before a righteous altar to change the speaking most of us are not ready for business, but we just want blessings. A man's life was involved. He served that spirit as his God, legitimized the presence of that spirit in your family, and died. Unknown to you, he covenanted all of you. He mentions all your names and says, Friday is yours. Ima, now you get her. Julie, he don't go to Ebo land. Now you only be. And he dies making those commitments. The only way to be reasonable in that matter is that one among you <laughs> will raise another one and say the same things. But it will speak righteousness. It will speak exhortation. It will speak peace. He called it What's the name? Jehovah Shalom. <laughs> and Yeshua. Hamashi. Lion of Judah. Agumeche. Yeshua Hamashi Lion of Judah Are you the one who is to come or so we expect another? Yeshua Hamashi 
Lion of Judah, Agonizem, Jesus, Amasi, Ekomina Salia, Lion of Judah, Agonizem. Are you the one that is to come? Can you not see me now? You take up a light one. Korea sabo kope na ipeta mo. Yesu sile bere kari abonde. Yalo! Are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect another? The effect of that darkness can only be solved by the replacement technology. Are you ready? To stand in the gap for your family. Are you ready to be the prophet that will bring rain in the times of drought? Oh my God. Tell the Lord tonight, I am ready. I am ready. I am ready. Let the drought see. Let the drought cease. Let a fresh rain begin to come upon the household. Let a fresh rain begin to come upon my family. I cannot hear your voice. I cannot hear you. I cannot hear you. I cannot hear you. I cannot hear you. Se cosa ni na fresca e palato bramenante e scopelo e scopela sila E alla mosina baba Eso 
Let on time be there be swallowed up. Let on natural poverty be swallowed up. Let reproach be swallowed up. I love you. 
He said, the blood of Jesus speaketh better things. A new priest with a new sacrifice that has vocabulary and utterance in the realm of the spirit must set up his own priesthood that speaketh better things. 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 In the name of Jesus. If you have ever had a warlock in your family, a wizard, a mage, a mage is a magician that has gained mastery of all the 12 windows of magic. Those ones can control nature. Those ones can send thunder. They can send lightning. If anybody like that has risen from your family, it means that you people were called to be priests. There's a, yes, there's a priestly lineage in your family. The devil just hijacked it to power his satellite. In your own generation, someone must dedicate himself like that in the same way to serve the prince of light in order to present a better sacrifice. Such sacrifices that speak better than the previous altar. That is the reason why I asked you, are you the one who is to come? For me, I know I'm the one. So even if I have opportunities to fornicate, I will not. Because the altar that I power is a righteous altar. If I have opportunities to commit adultery, I will not. Because I know what I represent. I am the priest of light that has come. Oh, oh, oh. I know the darkness that has been done in my family. So I cannot afford. No, I will not. Even those guys that operated in darkness, they, were, they didn't sleep around. They fulfilled the righteousness of the occult. They fulfilled it. Can you ask for grace? I am the one who is to come. I take responsibility for my family, for my people. I take responsibility for my clan. Oh, darkness will not speak among us. Gross darkness will not rise again. Only the priesthood of light. We were born to be priests. We were born to be messengers of the kingdom of light. So shall it be. Generation after generation, lineage after lineage, the sons of light will go forth. The sons of light will pour forth. Oh, Yale Komina! I am the one who is to come. Do not expect another. I will stand my ground. I will raise my life will be a sacrifice unto Jehovah so that he will reign and rule in our midst. Kobe Mamina Sike Brante Korea. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 
Do you witness untimely deaths? Mysterious deaths can, that cannot be explained. That's the sign of the altar of necromancy. That is what the Bible calls the shadow of death. It, if necromancy is practiced, death will cast a shadow. Human beings are for the slaughter. Because what powers the instrument of the altar is the sacrifice of human blood. Whereas witchcraft may afflict, witchcraft may divert, witchcraft may steal, but necromancy kills. It doesn't have any other language. It deals with blood. It deals with human sacrifice. It uses the destinies of men to power the destinies of others. Oh, oh, the unrighteousness had been on for long. Can you stop it? 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 Ziala Mokoria Basika Balababu. Iala Mamoko Sike. Mosia Sasela Bonde Balakuda. And so Konda, and so Kelly, and so Babalatale, and so Kendo Boka Balaka de Boko. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. I see in the spirit. I see in the spirit. I see someone that escaped from a grave. I'm seeing someone that escaped from a grave. It means your lifespan was measured. Your days on earth was going to be in the trend of them that were cut short before you. But you escaped. Wait, don't believe. Don't, don't believe it. Don't believe. You know, I told you I have a covenant. I have a covenant. It's a covenant that is tied to the presence of God. And it's not an emotional matter. Father, in the name of Jesus, can you be so gracious this evening as to show us which family represented here tonight that have been delivered from the sentence of death and now they have the liberty to live to full age. From my left hand side, Lord, to my right hand side, to men and women sitting at the balcony, I ask, Show me this sign. So, so their lifespan has been restored. Now bring them, bring them. Let us use them to liberate the entire family. So, are you there? Are you following? So what is doing that thing there is, an, is a righteous altar. When you bring it, it can swallow up. <laughs> and I belong to the family of Yahweh. And I am standing on the covenant of Yahweh. 
way. I am standing on the altar of Jerusalem. Now, the matters, the issues that we are talking about here are very terrible. This lady, you, you know, you know, I, I don't know how many of you see some obituaries and you, you wonder, is this? No, they are covenants. They are speakings. Many people in the mortuary have no business with death. But God wants to raise an altar of righteousness with you. So that the works of darkness can be forestalled. Oh my. Koba baba suke laite. Hiko babula. Hiko babula. Hiko babula. Hiko babula. Senikete. Hiko babula. Asaiketa mokoria. Hiko babula. Hiko babula. Hiko babula. Hiko babula. Hiko babula. Hiko Iko mama siya kande. Iko mama santo. Iko mama siya teli. Askido bonda. Ike teli. Ike da koske. Ike da koske. Tamina leite. Iko semina. Iko brela. Shale dana. I'm seeing something like like a, a rabbit. A rabbit. What was sacrificed on this altar? The last sacrifice on this altar was the blood of a rabbit. The blood of the rabbit. The family that is implicated by the sacrifice that I speak about God will arrest the person. God will arrest the person. God will arrest the person. 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 Holy Ghost! The altar manipulating our destiny. Bring her. The last sacrifice on it was a rabbit. We nullify the power, the power of that altar. That which it speaks, we cancel it in the name of Jesus. Can you cry again one more time for your family? Can you cry? Come, 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 come. Yes. Ile keke aiko sasale broske sasiko baba balatalia ikomba rakata ibonde sekatalia amboros kadi akande kure masato ekoskata lia kantelia eskobela ante konda iskabala ito kisko sasame nakande. A guy is a Santali, a guy is a Selama, a guy is a Santelia, Manda Baburuko se Saliko, Endo Cobre Baba Baba. Hey, and I below. I can't hear you. I am. Oranasi, Oranasi, Esi akibro obet ayise, Biroko menasi, Biroko menasali, Biroko menasali, Iga bayatom, Iga yaso, Iko breskede, Gila bro de makadia, Iga barata, Brisco balatalia, Engo menakande, Asketoria, Kilo bonda. Ask a bora, ask a sasela, hilo monda, iko pre, iko branta babola kabelaita. Thank you, Lord. Now listen, 
Listen. This is our prayer now. It has released fire. There's a fire that has come out of our altar. There's a fire that has been released. This fire is burning a field. It's burning, oh Jesus Christ. It's burning a field. Now, it, it, yes, it will begin to burn. Oh, oh, it will begin to burn. It will begin to burn altars. It's coming on altars. It's coming on altars. It's, it's burning. 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 Now, listen. We just retrieved. We just retrieved somebody's womb. Now, we just retrieved. We just retrieved a womb. A womb. A womb has been retrieved. A womb has been retrieved. Oh, I'm seeing things like exercise books. Somebody's certificate. Your certificate, since you graduated, you have not used it. It's, it's, it's been under an altar. It's been under an altar. So we are retrieving books. We are retrieving certificates. We are retrieving possibility. Oh, the fire is still burning. The fire is still going. The fire is going. The fire is going. The fire is... Oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, fire. Holy Ghost fire. Burn everywhere. Oh, fire. Holy Ghost fire. Listen, listen to me. Oh! Oh! Siala mama ke. Siala la la babokoto. The demons are leaving. The demons are leaving that lady. The demons are going. They are coming out of that lady. They are letting her go. The embargo is breaking. You know what I'm seeing now? Oh! The fire is burning, you know. Ile kabosa ikapala Korea ramposke te mele kedia. Now listen, listen to me. Someone here. Someone here. About two weeks, three weeks ago, you began to notice that your eyesight started becoming very bad. Your eyesight. About three weeks, two weeks ago. There's a decline in your eyesight. Where are you? I want to tell you why. Two weeks, three weeks ago, there's been a decline in your eyesight. And you've been asking, why is it so? Why is it so? I know fire, Holy Ghost, fire. Oh, oh, fire, Holy Ghost fire, burn everywhere. Oh, oh, fire, 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 burn. Now listen. The person that I'm talking about, the reason for which your sight is going bad, It's because a group of witches have decided that you will go blind. Now, it's not all of you. It's one person I'm talking about. And we'll find a way. Let's find a way of getting the person first. So I will touch you like this. When I touch the person like that, the hand of God will remain on you. When I touch you, the hand of God will remain on you. If I touch you, the person I'm talking about, the hand of God will remain on you. If I touch you, the hand of God will remain on you. The hand of God will remain on you. The hand of God will remain on you. The hand of God 
will remain on you. The hand of God will remain on you. The hand of God will remain on you. The hand of God will remain on you. The hand of God will remain on you. The hand of God will remain on that individual. Holy one. Anywhere, 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 anywhere. So now we release the blindness. Let it come on one of the witches. Let it come on one of the witches. Let the blindness be transferred. Let one of the witches take the blindness. Take the blindness. Before, I used to pray for the sick. Now, I channel the sickness uh, to people. Oh, oh, something is opening. Can, can you speak in tongues in a moment? Something is opening. Something is opening. Something is opening. Something is opening. It's opening. It's opening. It's opening. It's opening. It's opening, it's opening. It's opening. Selina Kobe Babala Sate Bakadia. Eto Bos, Eto Kalabos, Eto Seliman, Eto Sokobo Korea, Eta Babo Seke. Ah, so I see a marital door that has opened, a marital door, a marital door. Yes, it was locked up. Oh Jesus, oh Jesus, we disarm witchcraft, we disarm witchcraft, we disarm you in the name of Jesus, we destroy your power, we release the destinies under your hand in the name of Jesus. Koba baba latani, koba baba siya kanta. Hindo bokori abrasketa makori zika bante urama selikode. The embargo is lifted. It's lifted. It's lifted. It's lifted. It's lifted. Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay, finally, I see. I see an angel hovering with speed. And I'm wondering what is happening. What is going on? The Lord said, in order for you to come out of that bondage, you must be anointed. I'm talking to somebody. He said, in order for you to come out of that bondage, you must be anointed. So now, some people will be anointed so that you can come out of the bondage. It's coming. 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 It's an anointing. It's an anointing. It's an anointing. It, it is designed to bring you out. To bring you out. To bring you out. To bring you out. <laughs> 